maybe you can tell us a little bit about the loss of Lydia and that season of life? Well, Lydia and I had an excellent marriage for 30 years. So I didn't make a mistake in marrying a woman older than myself. Um, it, I felt that, you know, something had been taken, part of me had gone. And I was in deep uh, distress for several weeks. But then life began to take up its, its, uh, its, its pace again. But I told the Lord, Lord, if you want me to be single for the rest of my life, I'm willing. Then I went to Israel on a tour. And I was praying, Lord, is it time for me to go back to Jerusalem? Because I know that's where I have to be. And uh, I'd heard about a woman working for a ministry that published my material. And the night before I was due to leave Israel, I could not sleep all night. And in the middle of the night, I had a vision of a woman in a rather unusual dress and an unusual posture at the beginning of a steep winding upward path that led up to something like the old city. And I felt that God was showing me that's the path back to Jerusalem. It'll not be easy. It'll be steep and it'll be winding. But before that, you're to marry this woman. Well, I was really indignant with the Lord. I said, Lord, I, you ask me to marry a woman I don't know and don't love. And the, Lord, the Lord didn't answer me. So I thought, well, I'm going to pray about this. So I went back to the States and I spent at least a month praying. And I still had the impression God wanted me to marry this woman. So I thought, well, I'll, you know, faith without works is dead. I've got to do something. So I wrote her a nice letter saying, if you're ever in the United States, there's a fellowship in Kansas City that's very interested in Israel, and they'd be happy to have you there. Got a letter back saying, I'm leaving next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I arranged to meet her in Kansas City. And we had a little conversation together, and she, took, she asked my counsel about some situation she was in, but nothing very special. And then I took off to South Africa. Well, at the end of my ministry there, they gave me a generous offering in a South African rand. And at that time, it was not easy to get that currency out of the country. And I'd always had a sort of desire to own a South African diamond. So I went with the, the local jeweler, who was a member of the church, and we picked out a diamond. Then I said, how do I take this? He said, you just wrap it in a piece of paper and put it in your pocket, which was not my idea. So I arrived in Jerusalem with this diamond in my pocket and had breakfast with Ruth and spent the rest of the morning with her and then we had lunch together and at that time she was saying I'm tired I just can't answer any more questions so I said well maybe I ought to tell you why I wanted to meet you I said I had a vision in the night and I believe God showed me you were to be my wife <laughs> then I said as a matter of fact I have a diamond in my pocket <laughs> so that was the diamond she wore well she said yes and, well, there was a lot more to it, but I don't think you want the whole detail of everything. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> I <laughs> well, am interested in Well, I was detail. in a relationship with some other preachers, and we had agreed that we wouldn't do any, take major decisions without the approval of the others, or without consulting the others. So when I went back and told my brothers I was planning to marry this unknown woman, who incidentally had a, a spinal injury, which was partly crippling her, they said, we don't think that's right. So I said, well, and that's when I wrote the book, The Grace of Yielding. Well, what did they not think was right? Well, they didn't know her. She wasn't healthy. And in general, you know, people are a bit suspicious, especially when it's uh, somebody's seen a vision. So even though they were in fellowship with you, mm -hmm. and even though you had a quality a, high, a rather high quality of relationship, they suspected even you at having a vision. Yeah, well, I think people are suspicious of visions, basically, mm -hmm. or, or else they're too gullible. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying they were wrong. So I said, well, I've made my commitment. I have to go through with it. Well, then I had to go back to Jerusalem because I was organizing a tour. So I arranged to meet Ruth, and I told her, this is what has happened, and we have to say goodbye. 
And she said, all right, I'm, I accept it from the Lord. Well, then I spent a, a lot of time traveling and I went all the way to Australia. And somehow in Australia, I had the impression I have to pray this thing through. So though I was in ministry, I spent three days in prayer. And at the end of that time, I just felt it's prayed through. Later, I discovered that Ruth was praying at her end just about the same time. So when I got back, they changed their opinion. They said, it's okay. Now, these are the gentlemen that you were in fellowship yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Now, can, so you went on and you got married, yeah. and at that point you were living in Fort Lauderdale. That's Is right. that, that correct? Mm, we had a terrific wedding, 600 people. And, I mean, we said, first of all, we're going to get married. Let's, let's do it on Tuesday. Nobody ever comes to wedding on Tuesday. We'll keep a quiet wedding, just a few family members. The thing got out of hand. I couldn't control it. So we ended up with as many people in the wedding party as we'd have expected to have in the whole marriage. But well, it was a beautiful wedding. And incidentally, one of the brothers, I won't name him, who had originally opposed our marriage, got a prophecy in which he said, this is obedience to God. So it was a wonderful vindication from the Lord. I mean, I really respect those brothers. They were concerned for my best. That's what they were. Well, you have brought up about these men that you were in relationship with. And, and of course, that leads us into a little bit of an exploration of the framing of those very important relationships that shaped so much of your life. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you came into contact with them? I believe there was a Holy Spirit teaching mission that was going on, and, um, and then something about a room in a hotel where you covenanted with each other. Basically, what you're saying is true. What happened was we discovered that the man leading the whole conference was a practicing homosexual. And we got together, we said, we have to pray about this situation. So we got together in the room of one of the four brothers, not me. And we knelt down to pray about the situation. And when we stood up, we all felt, without even conversing about it, that God had joined us together in a relationship. So it was not something that we were seeking. In fact, I think all of us in some way or other would have preferred not to have it. But there was God did it. And that relationship produced a lot of fruit. It also produced a lot of flack, because people were afraid of us. They thought we were wielding too much influence and so on. Um, I do believe that the whole thing was from God, but I think we messed it up, to say the truth. Well, in, in trying to explore and understand how this relationship with these men, and there were five of you originally, is that correct? No, four. There were four of you originally. Mm -hmm. And then Ern Baxter was added. I see. And so you, you framed a relationship around a commitment and a covenant. Can you uh, help us understand what the framework of that covenant was, what the intent of it was, um, what you were trying to do, and what the, what the best of what the Holy Spirit was trying to get said through that to the church? Well, I think we were really committing ourselves to treat one another like brothers. And um, we felt God had given us a mission which was to teach certain truths of Scripture. But we were very different. I mean, some of the other brothers were somewhat reserved about some aspects of deliverance. So, I mean, we were a strangely assorted group. I think what God, re I'm, this is my interpretation, God wanted us to learn to treat each other as brothers. And there came points of difference between us. And this is my explanation. I think the problem was personal ambition in each of us, not, not excluding myself. And um, it's like Paul said to the Galatians, O foolish Galatians, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? And then a lot of what I would call legalism came in and human organization. And Everybody had to be submitted to somebody, and you, you were told where to pay your tithes. And, and I didn't find any of that in the Bible. And uh, 
so I became progressively more and more uncomfortable. And then I think in 1983, I just told the brothers, I can't go along with this any longer. And I think that also stirred up a lot of other people who were uneasy about the course that events had taken. And in a sense, it was the end of, not immediately, but it produced the end of that. But I would also add this, that was 1983, 1984, my own personal ministry, Derek Prince Ministries, took off in an explosive way and has been exploding ever since. But I don't think God would have released me until I broke that commitment which was not any longer scriptural.